Oh, hello there. Welcome to the 2020 Naval History Conference, a joint event sponsored by the U.S. Naval Institute and the Stockdale Center here at the Naval Academy. This year's theme is sharing the story of the U.S. military through the camera lens. I'm in shipping second class Jackie Booker. This is the second webcast of our event, and we have a special evening planned for you, a night at the movies with Captain Dale Dye. If you were able to tune into our earlier session, you learned that Captain Dale Dye brings a sense of realism to Hollywood by training actors to prepare for war films. Captain Dye himself is also an actor. His film credits include my personal favorite, Save It Private Ryan, Platoon, and Sniper. He's also worked with actors Tom Hanks and Samuel L. Jackson, as well as Academy Award winner directors Steven Spielberg and Oliver Stone. Prior to becoming an actor and a military advisor, Captain Dye himself served in the Marine Corps for over 20 years and also saw combat in Vietnam and Beirut. Captain Dye will be interviewed tonight by the Naval Institute's own Megan Eckstein. She serves as the deputy editor for USNI News. Previously, she covered Congress for the Defense Daily and the U.S. Surface Navy for Inside the Navy. She recently was named the Defense Media Award winner for Naval Systems, as well as the 2019 Best Young Defense Journalist. Megan, take it away. I'll be doing work as we should normally do. Have a great night. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the 2020 U.S. Naval Institute History Conference. Uh, my name is Megan Eckstein. I'm the deputy editor at USNI News. Typically, you'll find me asking admirals and generals questions about acquisition and budgets, but today it is my great pleasure to be here with Marine Corps Captain Dale Dye talking about the movies. Uh, so Captain Dye, thank you very much for being here with us. Megan, I'm glad to be, uh, glad to be here, glad to be anywhere actually in this, uh, in this COVID, COVID uh, panic that we've got going on, but, uh, but we're talking about a subject I love, so shoot, let's do it. Wonderful. Well, I hope everyone had the chance to see Captain Dye's keynote speech earlier. Uh, it's wonderful. I, I, very great content. We're going to dive a little bit into that, but just uh, for those of you who may have missed it, uh, Captain Dale Dye is a retired Marine Corps officer. He served 20 years in the Marine Corps, including combat tours in Vietnam and Beirut. After his retirement, he founded Warriors Incorporated, the entertainment industry's top military consulting company. An accomplished writer, director, and actor. His showbiz resume includes more than 50 productions. Some of those we'll talk about today. And uh, really looking forward to this discussion. So thank you again, Captain. Sure, welcome. So uh, just to tie your job and my job together a little bit, um, obviously we're, we're both in the media, we're both working with the military, but I think have a little bit different uh, viewpoints, um, you know, from the pop culture end, everyone seems to love a good military movie, uh, tons of support, you know, everyone wants to cheer on the good guys. And, uh, you know, from where I, I stand, you know, covering particularly the budget process, I think there is a lot of support for the military, but perhaps not so much understanding, you know, when the rubber hits the road and money gets a little bit tight, the number of times I hear, oh, well, if we just stop buying F-35s, then we'll have enough money for this other priority. And uh, certainly not to call anyone's support into question, but perhaps understanding. So that's where I wanted to start this conversation. You know, you are looking to portray the military in its entirety as clearly and as accurately as possible uh, for public consumption. And I just wonder if you worry that there's still a divide between what people see in your line of work and sort of, you know, a more cheery version versus um, you know, the understanding that has to happen in, in sort of the news side of things. Well, sure. Look, Megan, th th of course there's a divide. Uh, and if budget meetings and robbing Peter to pay Paul among programs were at all interesting, we'd make movies about that. But it's not. It sucks. And, and it's boring. Uh, Lord knows you know that. Uh, so we, we focus on the other end of it. Um, but in so doing, in the business of saying, all right, now the budget hassle is over and here's what it bought and here's what we can do and here's what we have done and so on and so forth. I think in large measure we bring an understanding to the audience that whatever that budget problem was was worth it and this is what we get out of it. At least I hope that's part of the message that comes across in some of the films that we do. Absolutely. Uh, just to play devil's advocate, you know, I know that you you insist on accuracy and details big and small uh, during the movies that you work on. But I, I just wonder, you know, wh what would be the harm if somebody was wearing ribbons instead of medals in their uniform in a shot or, you know, if they use slightly the wrong 
lingo, the, the wrong acronyms, you know, what's the harm uh, to an American public that may not even notice a detail like that? Well, the harm, frankly, is it's an insult. It's a blatant insult to those of us who've worn the uniform or are wearing the uniform. I mean, we, we owe it to our image, uh, to our legacy, to get it right. So it, it is important. Um, that's, that's just in a, in a, a drawn large uh, answer. But in a, in a more sort of micro answer, I mean, we can't, we can't make mistakes like that and expect people to uh, not notice because they do, even if they've never worn a uniform. They've seen enough on the History Channel and they've seen enough on uh, uh, news reports direct from the battlefield and, and congressional testimony and so on and so forth. They know what's right or they don't know specifically what's right. They know damn well when it's wrong. And that's what you've got to avoid. I think it's important. And, and if you don't do that, if you don't make that effort, uh, in my view, it's an insult. So I avoid it like the plague. Absolutely. Well, you've been doing this for a little while now. <laughs> Have you noticed over time, I mean, I don't know what kind of feedback you get, um, you know, beyond just the, the producers and the actors that you work with, but have you noticed that maybe expectations are greater over time, um, that things are more accurate? And is the American public maybe more literate in some of these military issues than they were, you know, a couple of decades ago? Oh, absolutely. Look, we, we live in a media saturated society. And the feedback I get every time we do a, a motion picture or a, or a TV program is massive. It's huge. I mean, I make myself available uh, to the men and women who wear the uniform. Uh, I say, look, if you want to contact me, here it is. Uh, and sometimes it's hate mail, but more often than not, it isn't. Uh, they're saying, look, we really appreciate the effort. Uh, we really thank you for trying to get it right. Now, is it important that we get it right uh, in, the, in the overview? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it really is. Um, because if we don't, uh, we're deluding people. And we shouldn't do that. Look, I work on films that are not necessarily overly complementary uh, to the American military or to the American process. And I think that's important. I think it's important that we show it warts and all. Because if you do that, people know you're trying to tell the truth. Um, does it make the military services, in particular public affairs officers, happy? No, it doesn't. And I get that. Uh, and I understand. But we have an opportunity here, to be honest. We have an opportunity to hear say, look, um, occasionally we screw the pooch and here's what happens and when we do here's how we investigate it and here's how we prosecute it if that's uh, the necessary thing to do and I think America appreciates that they want to see that that the military that represents them the military that fights for them is subject to the same sort of rules of conduct that they are only in a, a more stricter fashion well, that's uh, something else that your career path and my career path have in common as well. I, I just wonder, you know, some of the feedback that you get, uh, are there any areas where you feel like there is, you know, very good literacy regarding military issues, very good understanding? And are there any areas where you still think that the American public maybe just doesn't quite get it in a certain respect? Yeah, I, I think there is. I mean, there's a term that psychologists use called cognitive disconnect. And, and what it means is that uh, if you believe a thing is one thing, uh, if you believe black is black, and you've been told that all your life, and then suddenly I come on with a movie or a television program, and I try to convince you black is white, you get a cognitive disconnect. So there, there is that on the part of uh, the American public. And, and I think uh, if, if you try to do it right, if you play it straight, uh, you get over that cognitive disconnect. And we have an obligation, I think, um, to focus on who people are, who soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines really are. Um, and that's why I train from the inside out. Look, when I train an actor and I try to make him familiar with who we are and how we think and how we relate to each other, I have to work on his mind and on his heart and on his gut and his emotions. Um, and once I, once I get there, once I get a nodding, in, uh, nodding acquaintance with that sort of thing, then the mechanical stuff about how to carry the rifle and how to wear the gear, that's, that's easy. And that's what, that's what way too many movies miss, Megan, um, is, that, is that psychology, that, that dark humor that we use to relate with each other. 
um, I think that's important. Um, and it's, it's very, very difficult to convey in motion pictures or television, unless you're able to somehow acquaint the actors with it, give them a little taste of it, show them why you relate to each other like that uh, in extremis, in particular in combat. Those are the things that directors miss and writers miss. Um, and those are the things I try to correct. I, uh, I have a little bit of a familiarity with the dark humor that you're talking about. My grandfather served in the Marine Corps and I'm pretty sure that familiarity with that personality type is at least half my success in this job, uh, being able to relate to folks. Um, obviously, you know, I, I haven't even lived that full time being in the military. It's just through my grandfather. But how do you kind of describe, you know, that that common bond, that personality, that sense of humor? How do you describe that to an actor who's never served in the military? And can you talk a little bit about your training just to kind of, you know, get them to feel that on the inside as you describe? Well, you 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 can't do it through lectures. Um, you've got to you've got to show it. It's it's show and tell, uh, and that's specifically the way I use it. Uh, a lot of actors will come to me full of preconceptions. They'll, they'll want to replicate something they saw in the last bad war movie that they picked up on television. Uh, so I've got to get rid of all of that. And I do it in a, very, in a fashion that would be very, very familiar to anyone who's ever been through basic military training, um, especially in the Marine Corps. Um, I wear them out. I exercise them to death until their mind is just a blank. All they want to do to survive is just get away from that old white-haired bastard. You know, how do, I, how do I not get him on my case? And once I get them there, I've got kind of a blank slate. I've erased a lot of the ego. I've re erased a lot, a lot of the concerns about me, me, me. And now I can say, listen, you know, when you were out there stumbling around at about a mile and a half and a guy came up behind you and grabbed you by the elbow and pulled you along, oh, I'm sure glad he did that. Well, he did that because he cares about you, because there's something larger than himself. And that's the tell part after you've done the show part. And that goes on and on and on. And, and as training progresses, and as it gets more and more difficult, and as it gets more and more practical toward the, the script that you're trying to convey, you use every moment when something like that happens, and it always does, you use every moment like that as a teaching moment one of those, what do they call it, teachable moments. You, you use those things. And if necessary, you stop and you pull that lad aside and you say, listen, bear that in mind. Eat that. Get that in your guts. Get that in your heart because that's what happens in combat. That's how we relate to each other in combat. And that's why it works. That's fantastic. Uh, obviously, that's how you're able to, you know, contribute to greater understanding through the media. Um, I wondered, you know, talking to reporters like myself or civic groups or just anybody else out in the community, I mean, what more can other folks do to try to boost that understanding and really tell the accurate story about the military and the service members? Well, look, you know, there, there's a lot of this, um, you see it uh, every time, you know, I wear a military shirt or something, or you see a young man or woman in uniform, and there's a lot of that, thank you for your service and, and so on. And that's all great. I'm, I mean, I'm really glad. I went through a period when I came home from Vietnam when they, you never would have heard anything like that. So I'm glad to see that sort of thing, but it's superficial. What would really improve is if you spot that guy or gal and you just take five minutes. They've got five minutes and you've got five minutes usually. And you just say, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that you're doing what you're doing for us. Uh, tell me a little bit about it. Oh, well, I don't, yeah, no, just stay at it. And eventually you'll get a little feel for that and you'll see what wonderful folks they are. For the most part, they're just magic folks. They're, they, are, uh, they are concerned with service to the nation. They're concerned with duty. They're concerned with something larger than themselves. And they're very self-effacing. And if you get, if you could just get that impression through a 30 second, two minute conversation, then you've improved your understanding and your knowledge of what this nation is about. That's so important, thank you. And I hope uh, a lot of the viewers obviously are in the military, but I hope some other folks will take that to heart. Um, I wanted to turn to the most recent movie that you worked on that's uh, come out this year, uh, Greyhound. So I actually heard about it in the most nerdy of ways. Uh, before it was released, I was sitting in a House Armed Services Committee hearing 
uh, talking about next year's budget. And the congressmen on that committee are so excited that there is a movie that's out about sea lift and logistics. <laughs> so I, I first wanted to ask you kind of how, you know, I, I know Tom Hanks kind of had the idea um, and pulled the team together. How was he even drawn to such, I mean, you wouldn't think that logistics and movie making would necessarily go together, but it's a very compelling story. Um, so I wondered kind of how this project came together and how you were able to pull so much drama out of what essentially boils down to a cross-Atlantic sea lift. Well, that's, that's all down to Tom Hanks. I mean, he's, he's an amateur historian. He loves military history. He's a tinkerer. He's a guy who likes to understand how things work. Sometimes you have to stop him from taking things apart. Um, and, he, and he has that kind of mindset, but he has an understanding of military history. I mean, he knows, for instance, without me telling him, although I have told him a bunch of times, that the, uh, the, the really successful military commander on the battlefield uh, pays attention to tactics, and he pays attention to strategy, and he pays attention to training, and he pays attention to uh, the principles of ground combat. But most importantly, he lives or dies on logistics. And everybody that's been there knows that. And Tom knew that, uh, as well as C.S. Forrester, who wrote the, the book, The Good Shepherd, on, on which uh, Tom's uh, Greyhound uh, screenplay is based. Um, and, and I thought, and Tom thought, that um, the Battle of the North Atlantic in World War II was so seminal, so crucial, so important uh, to the prosecution of that war uh, that it was underserved, that people didn't really understand what that was about, uh, escorting convoys and, and fighting against these massive German wolf packs of U-boats that would come and, and harass and, and sink tons and tons and tons of, uh, of Allied shipping trying to reach Europe. So um, he understood, and, and I've always been a fan of, staging a screenplay, staging a movie on a small stage, you know, in an aircraft. In a, uh, in a tank uh, or on a, a small ship, like a tin can. Um, and, and so we thought, look, if, if we just concentrate the action, if we get inside that bridge and we get out onto a 40 millimeter bulfers and we get into the depth charge launchers and so on and so forth, it's a small stage. That, that's a slice, a microcosm of a larger war. And, and that's what we were after. And I think, I think we got it. I mean, Greyhound, um, Aaron Schneider, the director, is, is a real technophile. I mean, this guy, uh, we actually built part of a, uh, a destroyer and mounted it on a gimbal uh, on a soundstage in, in Baton Rouge so that the thing would rock and roll uh, as, as we needed it to. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, and then we, we shot some uh, scenes aboard the USS Kidd, which is a museum ship down at Baton Rouge now. Uh, so it was, uh, it was an opportunity, and, and Tom saw it and I saw it, uh, it was an opportunity to, um, to take a look at an aspect of that uh, world-changing war, that seminal event of the 20th century, uh, that, that really hadn't been examined very closely. And, uh, and it was an opportunity to show how one man, backed by his well-trained crew aboard a surface combatant can do so much and go through so much. And, and I think it was really important. I, I think um, we were dealing in an analog world um, and it was, uh, you know, now things are done digitally, everything's done digitally. But in those days, in those Fletcher class destroyers, those tin cans, Everybody was doing it with slide rules and, and whiz wheels and that sort of thing. And we wanted to show that. We wanted to, we wanted to make sure that people knew that part and parcel of fighting that war, fighting those individual battles against U-boats, was figuring out what the other guy's going to do and what you're going to do uh, to counter it. Uh, so, so we went to the extent of actually learning how to use those things and, and actually showing them being used on camera. Well, that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, my, my sense of drama from this may come from the fact that I'm a writer and not a mathematician, um, but it really struck me that you were able to use the anti-submarine warfare, the math, 
the plotting, the, the charts. I mean, that was all part of the drama. It wasn't just relegated to quiet moments when you had a, a hole in the plot or anything. Um, I mean, part of the drama was where is this U-boat and how am I going to do the math that way we can find it? And I was just curious to hear your take, um, you know, why that decision was made to really use that to enhance the drama and not just, you know, a, as a side fact. Well, I just think it was part and parcel uh, of the drama and we recognize that. Um, the staff in the Combat Information Center aboard that destroyer uh, had to do all this plotting with grease pencils and, and slide rules and dividers and that sort of thing, and then feed that information to the skipper, to the captain up on the bridge. And behind his eyeballs was this, this computer that was essentially going on, and he could see the situational awareness. He could see the pattern forming, much like submarine skippers do when they're, when they're making an attack approach. Uh, all of that was happening in his head. So if, if we wanted to convey how that was happening in his head, we needed to show people the information that was being fed into his brain. Um, and we wanted to show them that it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of punching a button or holding up a GPS or swiveling another, another radar screen. This, this was guys having to look through binoculars, figure it out, see the closest point of approach and figure out where the intersection happens and where to drop the depth charges. And all of that was, was so germane, so critical um, to the story that, that we just, we said, well, we, we can't just give that short shrift. We have to actually study that. We have to take a look at that. Yeah, in, in high school, I always thought my math tests were life or death, but this is actually life or death math. And it's just really very fascinating to watch it uh, play out on camera. So um, the other thing that really struck me about this story is that you know, it takes place during World War II, obviously, um, but the story is almost replaying itself in real time. Uh, you know, the Naval Institute printed a Proceedings Magazine article a couple of years ago called The Fourth Battle of the Atlantic, um, and it really lays out the concerns, uh, this time with Russian submarines rather than German U-boats, but just that concern that um, we're going to have to fight for the Atlantic again, and just you can't take for granted the fact that shipping from North America over to Europe is a guarantee anymore. Uh, and it just really struck me that this historical movie is also so relevant and so potentially telling of, you know, a fight that nobody hopes will come to pass, uh, but something that military planners are very much working on right now. Um, earlier this year, there was supposed to be a big exercise uh, to do exactly what Tom Hanks did in Greyhound, which is to escort convoys across the ocean. Um, unfortunately, COVID uh, had it scaled down pretty significantly. Um, but I, I wondered what you made of just the fact that it really resonates with current military discussions um, and whether that went into shaping at all how you approached the movie. Well, I knew it would. I knew it would resonate um, because, as I said, the crucial issue is logistics. Um, did it go into the planning of it? Was I reflecting on that uh, when we were actually training and, and getting ready to do this? No, not much. I was too busy with the detail. Um, but I knew, and, and anyone who's ever studied the issue will know that, uh, look, we're not going to be able to build an air bridge. Um, there's not enough C-17s and C-130s and C-5 galaxies and any other kind of aircraft to support a major tangle if we get in it and have to ship men and equipment and, and uh, soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines across uh, the North Atlantic. Uh, that's gotta be done by, uh, by ships. And we are, after all, uh, a maritime nation. The United States is a maritime nation. We live or die on, on uh, maritime commerce on our East Coast and on our West Coast. Uh, so these things are important to us. We understand the business of seaborne logistics. Um, do we practice it? Well, we damn sure should. Um, and I'm hoping that we do. Uh, I'm fairly confident, knowing uh, some, some fairly senior uh, naval officers who tolerate me in their, in their presence, uh, that, that we're aware of, uh, of, of the logistics concerns. Uh, and if, if Greyhound had a, had a little bit to do with tweaking that idea uh, or, or reminding people of the importance of things like convoys and convoy escorts and that sort of thing, then great. And, and we, we got a twofer on that one. Uh, the last question on Greyhound I wanted to ask you before we move on to other topics. Uh, working with Tom Hanks and a few other kind of repeat customers, if you will, um, 
you know, obviously this is diving into slightly different territory, talking about, you know, the Battle of the North Atlantic uh, versus, you know, other military engagements. But I just wondered, as you work with the same actors and producers and writers over and over and over again, I wondered how their approach evolves and whether they come into um, working with you maybe from a smarter place or whether they have an eye to the right details that they know you're going to be looking for. I just wonder how it, you know, starting your relationship and, and evolving through the years, how that's gone. Well, to begin with, early on when I didn't have any sort of resume or, or any, uh, any recommendations uh, backing me, uh, it was a terrible battle. It was an uphill battle. I was fixing bayonets and trying to stab somebody every day. Um, it's now changed a bit. Um, you know, when you win a bunch of Academy Awards and Oscars and, and uh, Emmys and that sort of thing, um, there's, a, there's an element of trust. Uh, so it's, uh, well, we better not do that because Cap Dial come in here and rip our faces off and we can't do that. So, so you do get that, that sort of trust. Um, but I think it's early on in the approach. Uh, the neat thing nowadays, see, I used to have to be reactive I had, I had to take a look at this mess that's been made in the script somewhere and, and figure a way to correct it, you know, before we commit and spend all the money and get it on screen. Uh, now uh, I can be proactive. Um, they let me into the writers uh, a little earlier and I can say, you know, I try not to ever say no because that damages egos. Um, but I'll say, look, um, I get where you're going with this. I, I know what you're, I know the dramatic beat here. I, I know what you're after, uh, but this would never happen. But here's something that will do the same thing that would happen. And then generally that's easy, that's an easy sell. Um, as long as you're, as long as you're careful with the egos because uh, there are some fragile egos in, in show business as you can imagine. But, but I think, I think what's happened is that uh, through my efforts and, and the efforts of some of my compatriots and people who are now working uh, in this business, um, we have made producers and directors and writers uh, much more aware that there's an obligation here to try to at, at least stay out of comic book land, you know, unless you intend to go there, but stay out of comic book land. You know, try to do, try to present the drama that you have envisioned but try to present it in a realistic fashion. That's fantastic. Uh, I wanna zoom out just a little bit um, and talk sort of about broader representation issues. Um, maybe not so much with Greyhound, but with other movies you've worked on, uh, there's always concerns um, about being maybe a little US centric, uh, concerns about how allies and partners are portrayed, maybe not so much the enemies because they're supposed to be the bad guys. Uh, but I just wondered kind of what your thought was on any concerns that have been raised um, and whether that's something you actively try to work with writers to maybe change that or if you don't think it's uh, as much of a concern. Two, two things here. Um, about the enemy, look, in way too many war movies, in way too many military movies, uh, the enemy is some cardboard cutout that's simply meant to run out there in front of the rifle sights and have his head turned into a pink mist. Uh, they're cartoon characters. And I think that's an insult. I think it, it not only is an insult to whoever the hell the enemy is out there, um, but it makes it look like it's way too easy. You know, it, it ducks in a shooting gallery. Well, that's nonsense. Anybody who's been in combat knows that that's nonsense. So my theory was that as much effort as I put into training the good guys, I need to put into training the bad guys. And I do that. I've built German um, Wehrmacht units. Uh, I've built Japanese units. I built uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army units, uh, and it pays. I may not spend as much time doing it, but at least they don't look like cartoon characters. At least they don't look like clowns. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and I think it adds to the value of the film. It adds to the desirability, the watchability of the film. Um, as for um, other nationalities, yeah, I, I hear about that regularly, and particularly when we're doing the Battle of Europe um, and uh, D-Day, like we did in Saving Private Ryan. Um, you know, they'll bitch and they'll whine about, you know, well, look, it's our movie. Yes, we're nationalistic about this, but we're talking about Omaha Beach. We're not talking about the full spread of D-Day. And besides that, we're writing the check. So look, if you want us to do all about what happened on Sword Gold and Juno on June 6, 1944, 
write your own check. Go up there and make that movie. You got people in there who could do it. You have English actors. You have French actors. You can do this. Uh, so I don't, I don't have much time for that, for that sort of thing, really. I mean, I understand. Um, but we're not doing a documentary here. We're doing a story that focuses on a particular area, as it, with, uh, um, with Saving Private Ryan, uh, the dog grain area of Omaha Beach on June 6, 44. We're not talking about what's going on up and on Sword Gold in Juneau, nor are we talking about what's going on uh, down on Utah. Uh, so it's a matter of focus. And that usually doesn't answer the mail from the folks who complain about it. I get that. But it's easy to say, look, I'll be glad to help you do your own movie. Uh, go out there and, and raise $50 million and then come back here and see me and we'll do a British movie about what happened on Sword Gold and Juno or a Canadian movie. Absolutely. Um, I wondered, you know, you mentioned um, the need to properly represent that enemy and I think that's very interesting. I wondered if there's either any other types of you know, common threads that are just generally very poorly represented, or if there's any movies that you've kind of watched and cringed and just worried about what that does, you know, inaccurately portraying military and just really kind of skewing the public perception in any way? Well, look, there, there are a number of cringeworthy uh, productions and, and those cringeworthy productions are kind of why I got into this uh, in an effort to avoid them. Um, but it, but it really was an attitudinal thing on the part of Hollywood more than anything else. Um, war was seen as something that, that should be prettied up. Uh, it was something that shouldn't be as filthy and dirty and horrible as it really is. Uh, because what, what movie star wants to look that way? Uh, yeah, I get that. I, I get that as, as a Hollywood position, but we're way over that. We're so far over that as a society worldwide. Uh, that, that trying to do that sort of thing would be a laugher. It would be a, a massive laugher. Uh, there, there are a bunch of them, a bunch of those kind of films that, that we've uh, hopefully gotten beyond. Uh, and, and more importantly, writ large, I think Hollywood's gotten beyond them. They understand the business of, of at least trying to give it a fair shake, at least trying to give an audience a fair view. Um. You spoke earlier about kind of portraying the military warts and all, which I think is so important. Um, it seems like, you know, it might be naturally a little bit easier to glamorize a war of the past, um, you know, just with, high, with, with time and distance and um, kind of be maybe a little more critical of current events. And I just wondered what you think that does to public perception. Um, obviously, you know, current wars are current. They're not done. There's no finality where you can judge them you know, with the eye of history. Um, but does that worry you in any way? Or do you think it's fair to kind of maybe turn a more critical eye to, you know, the, the current uh, military engagements? Look, I, I think it's going to be a while. Uh, take Platoon. It, it was 10 years after the end of the war before we were able to get that film made. And it, it certainly revealed some warts. Um, it was a very controversial film. And I think the same applies to, um, our, our involvements in the Middle East, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Jordan and Syria. Um, I think it's gonna be a while. We need, we need an end mark to then turn the camera on what happened in the past. Now, are those gonna be great, uh, wonderful flag-waving stories? No, uh, they won't be because it wasn't a great, wonderful flag-waving effort. Uh, they're gonna be hard-hitting, I think. Hopefully they'll be uh, written or at least advised or, or, uh, or shaped uh, by men and women who fought in that war. Uh, but right now we're just nibbling at those wars in dramatic stories and dramaturgy. We're, we're looking at this little story and that little story and this little story. We have yet to find the, the proper uh, overview for the thing. Um, and I don't know that we're ready for it right now. Um, we probably will be in another five or six years. Great. I wanted to ask you about a specific issue of representation, which has to do with uh, sort of racial norms of today versus in past eras. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a spat between Spike Lee and Clint Eastwood uh, when Spike Lee ac accused Eastwood of not including African Americans in Flags of Our Fathers. Uh, Eastwood argued that it's a historic fact that no black uh, service members participated in the flag raising because the military was still segregated at the time. 
Um, but a lot of the criticism of USS Indianapolis Men of Courage was that it had scenes that didn't reflect the segregation policy. So I just wondered how you look uh, both at the segregation issue and just other um, you know, social moral issues. Um, obviously the military has changed a lot and the country has changed a lot. So do you, how do you kind of mesh where we are today with you know, historical accuracy of the movies when you're doing you know, era pieces? Well, look, I, I fall squarely in uh, Clint Eastwood's camp on this one. Um, it would have been an insult uh, to try to insert a, a black guy, for instance, in the flag raising uh, on Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima. And hell, you didn't need to. If, if you want to be honest about it, there was one in there who was a minority, uh, Ira Hayes, Pima Indian from Arizona. I mean, Ira was there, and he was a big part of that, uh, that flag raising. Um, but but I, I'm aware uh, that, that uh, the, the efforts of minorities in World War II in particular, when the military was segregated and remained that way until 1948, uh, I'm aware that they're underserved. I get that. Um, for instance, uh, when we were doing the miniseries for HBO, uh, the follow-on to uh, Band of Brothers, and we did uh, The Pacific, uh, we were doing an episode with uh, Manila John Basilone on, on Iwo Jima. And, and while we were, were filming that, it occurred to me, um, you know, here's an opportunity uh, to show some black Marines who were in this area. Now, were they, were they up on the line uh, with fixed bayonets and were they climbing uh, Mount Suribachi and raising the flag? No, but they were doing a lot of other really important stuff. So as we turned the camera away from those major events, I tried to run a few of them in there and we did, we got them in there. And there was some question at the time, that, you know, what are you doing? Are these black guys here? They, did, do we have black guys in World War II? Yeah, we did. Uh, so we, we showed them loading up uh, bodies and wounded uh, in, into the Amtraks. And I'm, it was only seconds, but I'm really glad we were able to do that. Look, I, I don't think uh, movies that examine historical periods, World War II in particular, World War I is another example, um, Korea, to some extent, although Korea occurred just after the change had been made. Um, I think we do our nation and our history a disservice by trying to change that arbitrarily, by trying to use the power of the media to somehow say, well, it wasn't that way. Well, yeah, it was. It was that way. And the lesson is, it was that way then, but look at it now. Look at the progress we've made. And, and I think if you, if you look at it in that fashion, um, that it's, it's encouraging. You know, we don't have to mess with that kind of thing anymore. We're, we're better than that. We've learned from that. And so um, I think it's wrong uh, to arbitrarily try to just shift history, uh, wh whether it, it involves uh, racial uh, disparities or whether it involves sexual disparities. I mean, look, I, I was a big fan of a movie called Courage Under Fire, which was uh, involved uh, Denzel Washington and Meg Ryan. And uh, the MacGuffin in the movie was that um, Meg Ryan had done a, a tremendously heroic thing in combat, um, but because she was a woman, there was some question about whether or not she could be award should be awarded uh, the Medal of Honor. And you saw all the hidebound uh, old uh, uh, brass hats, and then you saw the new folks who were saying, oh, you know, this is a, this is a new world. Uh, I thought that was a, a very, very interesting exploration of that particular issue, and it was years ago. So we're aware of this. Uh, sometimes it's hard to, um, to get the funders, the guys who are writing the checks, to get them focused on those particular issues. But if you, you have to keep trying, and that's what we do. That's so important, the point you make of you know, showing where we came from to understand where we are today. I, I think that's wonderful. Um, I wanted to, to kind of throw a couple quick fun questions at you before I get to a few that have been submitted. I'll be the judge of whether this is fun or not, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you've probably gotten all of these before, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Um, so one question that has come up, um, obviously, you know, particularly war combat scenes um, can be very intense. Uh, and there's a lot that you can do with special effects and with the right acting and the right uh, techniques that you teach uh, your actors. 
But what's difficult to convey? Obviously, you have a viewer on the other side of the movie screen. Uh, what is it about war that is very difficult to, to get through the camera lens to the other side? Well, it, it has to do with, um, with the chaos. Uh, look, I've, I've always, and, and I'm an absolute witness to the fact that the best combat plan in the world goes right in the crapper when the first round goes down range. I mean, and, and, and you need to convey that. Um, the problem with conveying it is it makes us look like a bunch of boobs. It makes us look like a bunch of wild men running around. And sometimes that's what combat is. Um, so that's, it's hard to convey to people who've never, you know, heard the owl and seen the elephant in combat, uh, that, it, that it's so chaotic. And often uh, success or life or death is dependent on absolute strokes of chance. Um, and, and that's difficult to convey, uh, but it's a truth. And it's something that, that uh, I often, I, I tell writers and directors, don't shy away from that. That's, that's the way it happens. That's fantastic. Um, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, as your career has evolved, um, people, Hollywood generally is more aware of, um, you know, just trying to be accurate and trying to keep an eye out for the things that you'd want to keep an eye out for. Um, either early in your career or more recently, have there ever been any scripts where you've read that you just, you can't get on board? I mean, they're just so outlandish or just so off in some way that you, you can't be part of the project. Oh yeah. Uh, I've, I've read some dogs that just, I mean, they stink out loud. It's, uh, and, and actually, um, I'm, I guess to be truthful, I should admit that I've done a couple of them. Um, because, you know, I had to pay the bills like anybody else. So, you know, I need that paycheck. Uh, but these days, not so much. But yeah, there, there have been um, just so full of reeking with cliches and, and so full of absolute nonsense and political bias and slant and so on and so forth that I just say, you know, thanks for thinking of me, but uh, take this one and get out of my area. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned earlier kind of the rigorous training that you put the actors through uh, prior to the start of filming. I just wondered if there have ever been any actors that you've worked with who you just really think would make excellent service members. Um, and if so, kind of what was it about how they performed during your training that made you think that they'd be a successful, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, and marine? Yeah, there, there have been a number of them. Uh, and you might be surprised at, at some of them. Uh, Tom Hanks is a classic example. He'd been great. He'd have been absolutely great as a, uh, you know, as a young corporal in a rifle squad. He'd have been a beauty um, because he has that kind of mindset. You know, he can, he can see things, he's visual and he can see patterns. And that would be tremendously helpful, you know, in running a platoon in the attack. Um, Tom Berenger, for instance, uh, would have been a terrific uh, combat NCO or combat uh, young leader. Uh, he's, he's got that same kind of mind. He sees beyond things. You know, he thinks beyond the next couple of steps. He'd probably made a good platoon commander. And, and you might be surprised to learn that one of the, one of the actors that I thought was particularly good um, was Tom Cruise. Uh, I trained Tom Cruise as a Marine infantry NCO uh, for a film called Born on the Fourth of July. And he surprised me. I mean, he's, he's been depicted as kind of an effete uh, Hollywood guy and so on and so forth, but, but he isn't. He has, a, he has a tremendous heart. I mean, I can, I can remember training him and along with uh, some of the people in his squad and in his platoon uh, to do a uh, standard infantry drill assault on a fortified position and uh, base of fire and maneuver element and that sort of thing. Everybody who's ever been around it knows how that works. Um, but he and his, his squad couldn't get it right. And they screwed it up and they screwed it up and they screwed it up and got to the point where I said, listen, secure the butts. We'll take this up again tomorrow. I can't waste any more time. And he just ran up to me and he said, sir, 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 please, if you just give me one more chance, I know what we did wrong. I'll get this right. All right. One more time into the, off you go. And lo and behold, he got it right. They absolutely did it perfectly. The, the base of fire was in position and it shifted when the assault element moved in. The assault element used cover and concealment to move onto the objective uh, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, Navy folks probably aren't getting all of that, but it's okay. The, the point is uh, that uh, Cruz 
did it beautifully. And he, and more importantly, he had the heart. He absolutely would not quit. That's very exciting. Um, I, I wondered, you know, you've had so many very positive experiences with these movies, um, a lot of details that you've insisted on getting right. I wonder if you ever had any moments where you've gone back and watched any of your movies and realized, oh shoot, I overlooked that. <laughs> you know, are there any are there any gaps that have ended up in your movies or just anything you wish you could go back and Yeah, do? but but I've I've said something stronger than oh shoot at the time, <laughs> but uh, but I can remember it for, here's an example. Uh, we did a film called um, um, Rules of Engagement, uh, directed by Billy Friedkin and uh, um, and Tommy Lee Jones and uh, Sam Jackson played uh, best buddy officers, and uh, and I played the commanding general of the Second Marine Division, which is way over my pay grade, but it was nice to wear the stars for a day or two anyway. Um, and and we had some real logistics problems with that film. Um, I remember. Um, we shot the rescue. Uh, it was a MU, uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit, that was uh, sent in to rescue an ambassador in a Middle Eastern country. Um, and uh, when we shot it, we shot it in Morocco. So we borrowed from the King of Morocco, who happens to be, by the way, a huge movie fan. Um, we borrowed some of his helicopters to use in this thing. Now, the King of Morocco the Moroccan Air Force has only um, CH-47s, Chinooks, dual rotor aircraft. So we used those, we repainted them and so on and so forth and used them to bring the Marines uh, into this uh, rescue and recovery operation that was going on in the American embassy in wherever the hell we were supposed to be. And that was all fine, it worked out really great and the cameras loved the helicopters and, and so on and so forth, but then, we had to come back to the States and shoot the liftoff for that rescue mission. And because we were Marines and we, we shot aboard one of the LPHs that was in training off the, uh, off the West Coast and the Navy and Marine Corps allowed us to do that. But all the Marine Corps could give us was CH-46 helicopters, Sea Knights, which are visually very different than the Army Air Force version uh, CH-47. So we, we had, the Marines lifting off to go into the uh, trap mission in CH-46s and landing in CH-47s. Um, so it was, uh, you know, that's, that's a boner. I just could not do anything about logistically. It was the only way we could get it done. And I remember in the same film, um, we had finished the film and I was, we were, we were uh, previewing it, premiering it. So I went down through the, red carpet and so on and so forth and got in to see the film, the finished film for the first time. And everything looked good and everything looked good. And I said, oh God, the helicopter thing. And, but we, we seem to be getting over that. People seem to be tolerating it, of course, except for any helicopter jocks that were out in the area and they were gonna kill me. But, um, but I was watching a scene and here comes Tommy Lee Jones and Sam Jackson walking side by side and having this great philosophical discussion about the rules of engagement uh, how they're restrictive and sometimes uh, not clear enough. And, and they're walking by the camera. And I look at, at, at Sam Jackson's uniform. They're in alphas. Um, and one of his epaulets has flipped out on his shoulder and is laying over his collar. And I just, ah, I think I'll go into the restroom and cut my wrists. You know? But you're, you're always going to catch that stuff. And you... I like to say, if we get 99% of it, we've done a hell of a job. And, and my guys know that, but, but we always screw on. And the one you miss, the one you screw up, is the one that every veteran who sees that film is gonna focus on. And then my email lights up and the phone lights up and so on and so forth. But that's as it should be. It means they're watching closely. Well, I could ask you questions all day. I, I, I wish that I could keep going, but I do, before we run out of time, want to turn to a few that we've received from some midshipmen. Um, I know they're our key audience right now, and I know you'd love to uh, be able to talk to a few of them. Yeah, I would. And, and before we get into that, I got to tell you how much respect I have for the United States Naval Academy uh, and the uh, Brigade of Midshipmen. I tried, prior to enlisting in the Marine Corps, I tried to get into the United States Naval Academy so hard. I wanted it so bad, but 
I was just a dumbass. I, you know, I, I couldn't, I flunked the entrance exam, not once, but twice. Um, so I've always, I've always looked with, with great envy at the men and women who uh, get themselves through the boat school. Well, we're, so shoot, go ahead. We're not there at the moment with COVID, but our office at, with the Naval Institute is at the Naval Academy, and it's just such an inspiring environment to be in. So. <laughs> um, so the first question we have comes from Midshipman Second Class Dalton Hill. He says, uh, as someone who wants to be a movie director someday and has seen thousands of movies in every category, what advice would you give in the field of acting and being a director? Well, don't look. Um, I think you're already uh, on, on the right path. Uh, you mentioned seeing thousands of films. See a thousand more. Look, you've got to study how these things are made. Um, and the mechanics of it are something you can learn. Uh, you, don't, you don't need a formal course of education for that stuff. You're going to have a director of photography anyway. So what you really need is a sense of story. Teach yourself the three-act format. You know, run the guy up into the tree, throw rocks at him, and then get him back down out of the tree, which is the simplest way to, to talk about this, but learn story, learn story structure and where the dramatic beats are in those story structures. Uh, worry about the mechanics later. Um, the mechanics come when you first get your eye down on that eyepiece and take a look at a scene, uh, but you're never gonna get there if you don't understand story. Um, and all the good directors I know of uh, have come from the writer side of the house, the, the business of, of understanding drama. Uh, do that. And, and if you do that, uh, the rest of it will come. That's fantastic. Uh, the second question we have is from Midshipman Second Class Mitchell Vinzen. Uh, he's asked, he asks, is a war movie set a strange sight to see? For example, the D-Day scene in Saving Private Ryan, are only the actors and integral crew members on the beach for filming, or are there other crew members kind of standing idly by on the sidelines with their Starbucks coffee in their hands, kind of watching this realistic depiction of D-Day unfold before their eyes? And if that's the case, how do you ensure that everybody on the set is treating you know, such a serious topic, uh, war, death, destruction? Um, you know, it's not just another day on the set. How do you ensure everybody's taking it seriously? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of focus, and you have to be in control of that set. When we did uh, the D-Day sequence on uh, Saving Private Ryan, we had about 1,000 men on that beach. Um, and we had something like five cameras rolling. And yeah, there were people with the Starbucks cup and you know back behind there. But but I I push them back. I say, look, we need to stay focused here. And if you've trained those thousand people that are down on the beach, uh, what to do, and you've kept them focused, um, and you've you told them the importance of this, and you've told them the attitude, and you've told them the mood, and you've told them the drama, they'll focus. Um, now, if you've got people walking up in the middle of them, picking their nose and scratching their butt and, and offering them, you know, Kool-Aid, yeah, that's going to blow the mood and, and you've got to make sure that doesn't happen. And if it starts to happen, uh, Uncle Captain goes out and grabs somebody by the stacking swivel and that's the last of it. Um, but most directors understand that, especially their first directors and their director staffs, their seconds and their thirds. They understand you've got to stay out of that. You let people focus, you, and, and that, that's an artificial world out there, and you don't need to be interfering with it. Great, I have one last question I'd like to read uh, from a midshipman. We have midshipman first class Kenneth Stelmack, um, and he asks, uh, real combat is chaotic, it's loud, it's bloody. Uh, obviously you're aiming for realism, but at what point does the realism become too much for a general audience? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's a line that I've been looking for my whole career. I'm just not sure. I, I know, thank God we don't have smell-o-vision um, because that, that would be a, a line that we should cross, I think. I'm not sure where it is. Um, you know, because of, of television in particular, uh, because of uh, news reportage live from the battlefield, uh, we often, can tolerate much more than people think we can. Um, and when we start noodling around what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, I get a little worried. Because there's very damn little in combat that's acceptable to the average human being. Um, but I don't know exactly where the line is. It's a feel, Megan. Um, 
I'll, I'll get into a scene and, and watch it unspooling and watching the actors perform like, ooh, do we need to do that? Is, is that crucial to the, uh, to the storytelling? Or can we pull back on that? Is it, if it's crucial to the storytelling, now I'm gonna say, yep, roll. Um, but if it's not, and we're just doing it gratuitously, uh, then I, that, this warning signals start to go off. And I say, wait a minute, we, we don't need, that's not relevant. It's not germane. I don't know why the hell we're doing this. And it's sometimes a fight because some of that stuff that I consider to be not germane or not relevant is really ghoulish and, gore, uh, and gory. And, and that's cool to some directors who haven't ever had to be on the operating end of it. So I don't know where the line is. Uh, I think the line is still forming. I, I think it's still fluctuating. It's still out there. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I've got an eye on it. Well, Captain Dale Dye, I could keep asking you questions all day, but unfortunately, I think we've run out of time. So on behalf of myself and the Naval Institute and all of our audience members, I really want to thank you for your time today. It's been such a pleasure getting to hear from you. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk about these things. I'm a huge fan of our men and women in uniform. I'm a huge advocate for them. Um, and I think uh, talking about and explaining about how I try to use the popular media to advance uh, their agenda is, is probably worth doing, and I've sure enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.